Hello, API Days peep. So, as you can read on the slide, I would like to start today's talk with a tale as old as time. On a fateful day in 1485, the fields of Bothworth in Leicestershire, England, were stained red with the blood of thousands of brave soldiers as they fought for the ultimate prize, the English throne. For almost three decades, England was embroiled in a brutal and merciless struggle for power with the crown changing hands seven times. The Wars of the Roses was a time of unimaginable violence and destruction, where noble families turned on each other in a frenzy of bloodlust and the very fabric of society was torn to pieces. Wait, why am I here? reciting you a GCSE history lesson. Isn't today's talk about green software? So, let's reset. Rather than a field between the English noble families, let it be the Crusaders of Code competing for the title of the fastest language. On one side, we have the mighty Java C, armed with their powerful compilers, ready to strike with lightning fast execution times but do not underestimate the underdogs on the interpreted side. The cunning JavaScript and Ruby have joined forces, ready to unleash their deadly dynamic nature. And there was Python, once loved by many for its speed to market, struggling even to make it to the center of the battle. So, which programming language do you think will emerge as a leader as the fastest language? But wait, why are we pitting those coding warriors against each other? Before we begin, let me quickly introduce myself. So, hello everyone again. My name is Sarah Su. I'm originally from Taiwan, but I've been living in the UK for the past decade and a half. I'm a site reliability engineer working for Goldman Sachs. I'm somewhat similar to a medieval knight when it comes to switching between various responsibilities. When I'm not doing fun SA stuff for Goldman Sachs, I'm speaking and writing fun green stuff for the Green Software Foundation. Currently, I'm writing a new O'Reilly book titled Building Green Software with two other amazing women. The book currently has five chapters out in early release, so feel free to check it out and let me know if you have any feedback. Additionally, I'm the project chair for the Green Software course for the GSF. Recently, in collaboration with the Linux Foundation, we launched a free online course to help you learn how to design, build, and maintain more environmentally friendly applications. So, how did I end up here? Have you ever felt like your efforts um, to be more environmentally conscious weren't really making a difference? That's how I felt for a long time. I've always been conscious about the environment, specifically around reducing waste. I would preach to my friends and family about reusable bottles, cutlery, takeaway boxes, you name it. But um, that did not get me very far at all. Then I discovered green software. As cheesy as it sounds, you changed everything. As a software engineer, I realized I could have a significant impact on the environment in my day-to-day -day work. I no longer had to leave my climate enthusiasm when I walk into my office every single morning. Though, it's probably for the best for everyone that I leave my reasonable preaching behind. Then, I took a career turn and decided to become an SRE. I know, crazy, right? So, I've been an SRE for nearly two years now. As a fairly new SRE with a passion for green software, I've been spending the past few months looking at DevOps practices and SI principles through Green Lens. So really, my goal today is to encourage you to take a fresh look at your day-to-day -day work through a green software lens. Before we revisit why we're pitting the coding warriors against each other, let's go back to basics and talk about the three approaches that make software green. So what is green software? Well, simply put, green software is software that is carbon efficient. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, 
When I say carbon, I'm referring to carbon dioxide equivalent, which is a term that's used to refer to all greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases are gases in the earth mass in the earth's atmosphere that can trap heat. They let the sunlight pass through the atmosphere, but they prevent the heat that the sunlight brings from leaving. Basically, we can think of them as a blanket heating our planet. Overall, greenhouse gases are a good thing. Without them, life as we know it would cease to exist because it'd be far too cold. But an excessive amount of anything is a never good thing, including greenhouse gases. So, what can we, software engineers, do about those excessive carbon emissions? At the Green Software Foundation, we firmly believe that software engineers have a responsibility to minimize the carbon emission produced by the software we build. In other words, we need to find ways to make our software more carbon efficient. Today's a lucky day because we're going to go over the three approaches that we have identified for achieving carbon efficiency in software. Let us look at the first approach. The first approach is about energy. Basically, if we can build applications that use energy more efficiently, this is not just a good thing for us, but for everyone. Especially when we consider how volatile the energy market can be. Remember the energy crisis in Europe last year. It goes to show that the way energy is produced is often overlooked because people just want electricity. And sometimes people have to look the other way when it comes to the carbon, the carbon side effect, because hospitals and schools need to be heated and have their lights turned on. So, if you can design your application to be more energy efficient, you are effectively making your applications more carbon efficient, as energy usage is normally seen as a proxy for carbon emissions. So the next approach for achieving carbon efficiency in software is all about hardware. Basically, when we are building software, we need to be mindful of how we are using hardware. Why? Well, when hardware is created or destroyed, it emits carbon just like any other object, and we call this the embodied carbon of an object. So the embodied carbon of hardware. Is the carbon emitted during the creation and destruction of that piece of hardware? In simpler terms, similar to electricity, hardware usage is like a proxy for carbon. The less hardware we're using, the less carbon we're emitting. Let's take a look at the last approach. We all know that electricity production is still the main culprit behind the climate crisis we're facing today. But did you know that not all electricity is produced the same? Some are considered cleaner than the others in terms of how much carbon is produced as a byproduct, and this is where carbon-aware computing comes into play. Basically, we need to adjust the workload of our applications to match the availability of clean energy. What does this mean? This means we should do more when electricity is clean and do less when electricity is dirty. So, as software engineers, we need to ask ourselves: Can we use electricity more intelligently? Have we considered shifting our batch jobs to a time with more clean energy is available, or maybe deploy application to a region with better access to clean energy sources? So now, we know that green software is all about creating carbon-efficient software, and we've discussed how we can do that. By being efficient in energy usage, being mindful of hardware usage, and lastly, using carbon aware techniques. Shall we go back to discussing if code efficiency can save us from this pesky climate change? Sadly, not quite. Why? Let's consider some green goodies, or as I put it on the slide, green deeds. You might be thinking, yes, efficiency. Optimization has served us well in the past. Efficient code should be a game changer when it comes to conserving energy. And you're not wrong. For instance, with optimized code, computers can usually complete tasks faster and with less energy. And that's because optimized code typically requires fewer CPU cycles to execute the same tasks compared to the optimized ones. But there's more to it than just energy efficiency. Efficient code 
also tend to require fewer computing resources to run, which in turn can help extend the lifespan of a device. And that's because if code is optimized to use fewer resources, we essentially are placing less strain on the hardware, helping it to last longer. So efficient code is pretty beneficial on hardware front too as well. And lastly, imagine running out efficient code on clean energy. Another wing, right? But I hope you know there was a huge but coming. Writing efficient code really is not a task for the faint hearted. It's complicated, difficult, and typically requires highly specialized knowledge, which can lead to much longer development times and significantly impact developers' productivity. Even if you do manage to write efficient code, it can be challenging to maintain it in the long run because that specialized knowledge isn't always easily transferable. Documentation should help, but let's be real, good documentation or any documentation is not always easy to come by in our industry. And lastly, let's face it, we can't just rewrite everything in C or Go as much as we might want to, it's just not practical or feasible. Let's talk about what happened with LinkedIn Lite in 2017. The LinkedIn Lite app was created to make LinkedIn more accessible, so professionals in low connectivity and low bandwidth area can better utilize the service. The team behind the Lite app wanted to test a new feature, so let it head it out to a small city about 100 miles away from Mumbai. And you can probably guess what happened. They quickly ran into a problem. The feature they wanted to test failed to load completely due to poor internet connectivity. This was a huge wake up call for the team who realized that they desperately needed to optimize their code to ensure that all users could access the app regardless of their internet or location. Of course, not every app needs to be optimized to this extent. If you're developing an app with a small user base and where the majority of users have reliable internet connectivity, such as an internal web app with users only in central London, you working on optimization before encountering a problem might not be the best use of your time or effort. But for LinkedIn, with massive user base of over 42 million users in India alone back in 2017, Optimization is essential to improve performance and ensure accessibility. So we can see that writing efficient code does have environmental benefits, but it's not always the most effective way to achieve green goals. And let's be honest, most people only do it when it's absolutely necessary. That being said, there are circumstances where efficient code really shines. And one of those is at scale, just like what happened with LinkedIn Lite. If the code you're writing is going to be deployed on every single server out there, then it's absolutely crucial for you to figure out how to write the most efficient code possible. So even though it may not always be the go-to solution, writing efficient code should not be overlooked in certain circumstances. So, Going back to our original question, is efficiency the end of the story for green software? Well, it can be, as most techniques for achieving operational efficiency draw parallel with those for achieving carbon efficiency. Let's look at an example. Show of hands, who here has used infrastructure code to manage their infrastructure and felt like it was taking paracetamol for a headache? I know I have. Let me paint you a picture. Say, you're building a web app that needs a database. In the past, you have to spend hours setting up the database server, installing the software, and tweak the settings. A tedious and error-prone process. And that's just for the database part. You still need to figure out where your web app is going to live. And what if you want redundancy and needs to have the infrastructure set up in multiple regions? It's already a long enough process for one region. But with infrastructure's code, we can automate this entire process. Essentially, we are writing code that defines the state 
we want our infrastructure to be in. We can easily set up resources and configurations in various environments across multiple regions without much hustle. This not only saves us time, but also ensures that our infrastructure is consistent and reproducible. So, with infrastructure's code, we're not just making our infrastructure consistent and reproducible, we're also making it sustainable by being efficient through automation. Basically, we're making things easier for ourselves and saving energy at the same time. Additionally, we're not wasting any unnecessary embodied carbon either because IAC can help with dynamic scaling. And how about applying a carbon away approach to infrastructure as code? For example, we could have a setting that will allow us to dynamically deploy our resources to regions that currently have more clean energy resources. Another point, compare with code efficiency, infrastructure's code is not as limited regarding which context is applicable. It can be used across nearly the entire software business, making it a really powerful practice to reduce our carbon impact. Personally, I find IAC fairly easy to learn, which in terms can make knowledge transfer much more bearable. And lastly, we're incredibly spoiled for choices. There are loads of available tools for us to use from. Now, let's take a look at how Infrastructure's Code contributed to N26 amazing growth story. N26 is a mobile bank that offers a variety of financial services to customers in Europe and the United States. As the company grew, it faced a big challenge in managing and scaling its IT infrastructure. It needed to quickly deploy new features and services to meet the needs of its customers. So to address those challenges, N26 turned to infrastructure as code. The results were really impressive. According to one N26 engineer, everything's updatable, everything's traceable, and everything is reproducible. In other words, N26 was able to implement changes to its infrastructure quickly while ensuring consistency, accuracy, and security through automation and validation. And it really paid off for them. When vulnerabilities that affected most of the microprocessor worldwide were discovered, N26 was able to use infrastructure's code to quickly respond and roll up patches across all of their environments and regions. What's really interesting is that we can see the benefits of IAC go beyond the traditional ones. It can also help us become more environmentally friendly because DevOps practices align pretty well with those carbon efficient ones. By using IAC, we can essentially reduce our carbon footprint through operational efficiency. In N26 case, not only did infrastructure's code improve the security and reliability of their system, but you also allow them to become more efficient with carbon by reducing the time it took for them to fix the vulnerabilities. Pretty cool, right? So, are there any other operational practices you can draw parallels with those green software ones? I'm just going to call pause here for a bit. Right, so what's next? So far, we've gone through the three approaches that can make software more sustainable. We've also discussed why writing efficient code may not always be the best tool in the box for achieving greenness. Lastly, we hope to have convinced you that many DevOps practices are more suitable for the ultimate goal of reducing carbon emissions. So what's next? What can you do and where should you start? Firstly, we have the free course I mentioned earlier on the guiding principles of green software. Sometimes I envision this course as Narnia's wardrobe, which can lead us to more advanced topics in the field. There are six parts to this course. The first three, as mentioned earlier, cover the three distinct approaches that can make our software more sustainable. Then we have a section on different climate jargons you've been hearing about, such as the net zero strategy. Finally, we also briefly touched on the million dollar question in the field. How do we measure the carbon impact of our software? As we wrap up, 
I just want to reiterate my goal for today. The objective here is to get you to start looking at your day-to-day -day work from a green software lens, especially now that you're equipped with the three approaches that contribute to greener software. Every decision you make, that being small or large, can have an effect on the overall carbon footprint of your work. So yeah, no pressure. I'm going to finish today's talk with a cheesy quote that we came up with. Let us use sustainability as a motivator and differentiator for software engineering problems. Thank you for listening.